video is to help you understand the essay, The Conversation of Races, by W.E.B. Du Bois. Keep in mind that you can always go to the YouTube version of this video, click on the closed captions, and then in the more dot 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 choice, you can look at the transcript, which will help you pull out the main points and the notes that I cover. Also, as you look at the video, it might be helpful for you to have a printout of the essay that you can mark and make your own notes on as, um, and pause the video if you need to make notes so that you can critically read your copy. This was an essay, an occasional paper for the American Negro Academy. And in 1897, it was pretty typical to use the word Negro rather than Black or African American. As you know, that usage has changed a few times. And currently, African American or Black would be the acceptable term. However, when Du Bois says, you know, when I'm reading a direct quote where he uses the word Negro, I will quote it accurately. The makers of this website are wonderful, and they offered us, at the beginning, a few scholarly articles that explain and discuss this very important text. And at the beginning of the text is an announcement in which Du Bois explains that his purpose in writing is to bring together African Americans and a common purpose to represent to the rest of the United States, and also to um, to call to call to mind that the difficulty of the upward struggles, as he said, for African Americans to claim their cultural greatness are hindered by the assaults, the vicious assaults and the racism of that particular contemporary moment. So in the beginning of the essay here, in the first paragraph, he says that we have always had, quote, an intense personal interest in discussions as to the origins and destinies of the race, but certain assumptions about his natural abilities, political, intellectual, and moral, that get attributed to race, African Americans have always known are wrong. So the question is, what is race? Knowing, as Coates points out over a hundred years later, that race is the child of racism, not the father, here we have another example of racism defining race as inferiority rather than the contributions and the culture and the community and traditions of a race that Du Bois wants to discuss. He also points out in the second paragraph here that there is a division in the United States of races and it's extreme in the United States and that a problem results that is intense and important because, as Coates would tell us, this material reality of race that has developed and been invented comes down with remarkable impact upon the body. Du Bois brings up a few examples of this jeopardy of the body that the idea of race promotes in the racist United States of 1897. Separate schools, wage discrimination, lynch law, but he wants to ask a broader and more philosophical question about race. And really what he's doing here is diverting what people think race is, which is racism, which is a bunch of labels and stereotypes and inferiority, and redefining race in the terms that he wishes to propose so that he can represent African Americans differently than dominant society represents. So the, chat, the paragraphs, as you see, are really conveniently numbered. Since 
he suggests that our ideas about race are flawed and inflected with ideas of inferiority that are invalid. He um, asks in the end of paragraph three, what is the real meaning of race? And how will African Americans contribute to American society? Now, in order to debunk the idea of race that's really common in his historical moment, he talks about the assumption here in, chapter, in paragraph four that human beings are physiologically different. From the marble-like pallor of the Scandinavian, he says, to the rich dark brown of the Zulu. And certainly these physiological differences or racial markers help people very often to identify members of their own race in a positive context or become dangerous outward symbols that can put people's bodies in jeopardy if people believe in the racist definition of race. He, what Du Bois really wants to say in this paragraph is that everybody is obsessed with the supposed scientific explanation of race. And by everybody, I mean other scholars in his contemporary moment. He is a Harvard PhD, but other Harvard PhDs and various very well-known scholars worked quite hard to prove that race is a physiological difference and that it creates a hierarchy of humankind. He briefly references Huxley and Ratzel and Blumenbach. And here is a pretty basic example of the common idea of racial hierarchy that was popular in 1897. At the top were whites and Europeans, and Huxley and um, Blumenbach simply proffered ideas that they claimed were science, such as the idea that white people were the most perfect and beautiful race, and every other race was a degeneration or a corruption of pure white blood. This was a really common idea, and we today call it the pseudoscience of race because it's not really scientific, but most white Americans really accepted it as the truth and as science, especially in 1897. So our hierarchy here has whites and Europeans at the top, brown and mixed people, then indigenous or native people, and at the very bottom, black and African people. This whole process of talking about race, however, wasn't just limited to a simple kind of black-white hierarchy. Even within European societies, they made arguments about different European races and what physical characteristics demarcated them as superior to inferior. So here we have another example of a racial hierarchy with Teutonic, largely German at the top, and their um, perfect and beautiful characteristics. And then the Alpine or the Celtic, meaning the Irish, which is somewhat degenerated and not as good as the Teutonic. And then at the bottom, the even less valued Mediterranean race. When Coates talks about the people who think they're white, he's talking about the ways in which these disparate people and these different looking people all ascribed to or signed up for an American definition of whiteness that oversimplified race to something that looked more like black and white. And that is really what Du Bois is talking about in paragraph four as well. At the end of paragraph five, he says, sociologists, people have divided human beings into races, which while they perhaps transcend scientific definition are clearly defined to the eye of the historian and sociologist. In in other words, what he's saying is the physical differences among members of the human race don't really differentiate race because someone can have very fair skin and very kinky hair or someone can be very dark skinned and have straight silky hair. So all of these physiological markers and measurements of, of the nose or the forehead kind of get mixed up together when we really look at the human race as a whole 
and it's not clearly demarcated so that you can really say that race is a scientific entity. Du Bois is somewhat subtly challenging the idea that race is a scientific entity. He says, however, that even though we have divided human beings into races, which are beyond scientific definition, the historian and the sociologist can still identify races according to a different set of characteristics. And that's what he wants to think about, and that's how he wants to redefine race. The history of the world is the history of groups. A race is a vast family of human beings generally of common blood and language, always of common history, traditions, and impulses, who are both voluntarily and involuntarily striving together for the, the accomplishment of certain more or less vividly conceived ideals of life. And in many ways, there are resonance between this definition of race and how we in our class have defined culture. When I asked you what culture was, you said history and traditions. You said um, common connections and family and community and shared language and ways of communicating. So this is a cultural definition of race and treats race as a social construct, as the footnote, the side note above says. And Du Bois is really groundbreaking here in his insistence that race is a social construct. In real history, there is universal pres presence of the race idea, he says. But its efficiency is not necessarily good for understanding human progress. What is a race? Turning to history, um, race is an ingenious invention of human progress. The race ideal and in this context, he refers to the idea of whiteness, the people who think they are white, just as Coates does. This white racial ideal invented the, um, the idea, or was a, a process by which human progress could exploit, take advantage of, and build a nation upon the bodies of Af people of African descent because they created this idea of race. And so Du Bois is pointing out the material conditions that historically led to the idea of race in the United States. And then he goes back in paragraph eight to talking a little bit more about all of the different manifestations of race that, e that exist in the world. And he's having stated in, in paragraph seven that there is this race ideal, he once again goes back and talks about all the variations even among so-called white or Asian or black races that really call into question the idea that there are scientific differences among people. So he asks in paragraph nine, what is the real distinction? Is it physical differences? And more or less, he says, no, that is a load of crap. Instead, he wants to talk about the deeper differences, spiritual, psychic differences, undoubtedly based on the physical, but infinitely transcending them, the forces that bind us together, race identity and common blood, a common history. Now, I'm not sure why he says, okay, there's vast differences and they're probably based on the physical, unless he is talking about region, inasmuch as the Scandinavian with the marble-like pallor developed his or her civilization in a cold Scandinavian climate and landscape, and African culture developed, as I described it, and Patricia gave me some street cred for that interpretation, African culture as a place of warmth and sun and connection between people such that we see African music having the heartbeat as its central rhythm. So, you know, in that way, there's this kind of physical connection to, to place and location that might be part of what we inherit in our, our racial identity, and, but that is very much a way that culture manifests itself. <laughs> 
He continues in talking about the difference between a race and a nation because what he now wants to begin questioning is the place of African Americans within white nationality. So again, this is a black nationalist move. He's saying that there is something beyond white nationality and that African Americans are never really going to be included in white nationality, especially as we see at the bottom of paragraph 10 because um, people of Anglo descent claim constitutional liberty and commercial freedom or capitalism, being shopkeepers and merchants, as their contribution to society or to civilization, and Germans consider themselves scientific and philosophical, and the Romance nations, Spain, perhaps Italy, created the da Vinci's and, and the great literature and art and contributed to civilization. But Du Bois wants to know, then, what did Africans and African Americans contribute to civilization. He brings up the possibility that Egyptian civilization was Negro in its origin. It was very closely allied if it was not, he says. But because of the material consequences of history and the exploitation built on the backs of exploited Africans in the diaspora and through the Middle Passage, Du Bois says that we don't really know what Negro genius looks like. And I'm using that term because he says here below, for the de development of Negro genius, of Negro literature and art, of Negro spirit, only Negroes bound and welded together, Negroes inspired by one vast ideal work can work out its fullness, in its fullness, that great message we have for humanity. So Du Bois sees it as imminent, and that if African Americans can come together and be unified, then the great contributions to civilization that African Americans can make become evident and allow black people to take their equal place within the world and ideas of culture. Eight million people of African blood in the United States must come to realize that if they are to take their place in the van of pan-Negroism, he, a few years later, will go to a conference called the First Pan-Africanist Conference. So again, he's suggesting that a, common, a connection to Africa makes the African-American contribution to the world really distinctive and important. And moving forward, he points out, just as Coates says that black culture is not a photo negative of white culture, that the destiny of people of African descent is not absorption by white America. That if blacks can evolve some of the great heroes of the past, then blacks in the future can make a contribution to culture. He guards against assimilation and absorption into white culture. He warns against intermarriage because the idea of intermarrying and just creating one light brown race in the United States was not unheard of as a solution to the race problem. Even Thomas Jefferson, a hundred years before, thought that Native Americans would be absorbed into Anglo-American culture. Now, Jefferson didn't believe that African Americans could be assimilated or included. And to a certain extent, Du Bois is giving a black nationalist cultural message. He says, no, we don't want to be assimilated. We don't want to be whitewashed. We don't want to be included in a way that denies our uniqueness and our African connection. But then he moves on to a more political black nationalist message in paragraph 14. Here is the dilemma. Am I American or am I a Negro? Can I be both? Or is it my duty to cease to be a Negro as soon as possible and be an American? If I strive as a Negro, meaning 
continue his black nationalist message? Is he not perpetuating the divide between black and white? Is he not continuing the threatening separation between black and white? He asks these questions, but the answers to the questions are not necessarily straightforward. They're rhetorical questions. And Du Bois is a black nationalist. He's saying that you have to be both at the same time, and you can't let go of either side of your identity. You shouldn't hide under the veil of race pride. And every rascal and demagogue who chooses to cloak his selfish deviltry under the veil of race pride there's a reference here more to white racists, not to African Americans practicing race pride. But we think about white nationalism today and the extent to which that kind of race pride is simply a cloak or a cover for some of the devious and evil behavior based purely in hate. So then he entertains the question of prejudice. There's friction between people. But why, he asks, because in the United States, we, have, we stay in the same territory. We have the same laws. We have the same language. Many of us, many of us the same religion. If there was differences in those things, there might be a fatal collision, as Thomas Jefferson describes it, between the races. But what Du Bois wants to point out here is that there is substantial agreement between black and white Americans in laws, language, and religion. And if there is a satisfactory adjustment of economic life, meaning economic black nationalism here, if black people are allowed to progress economically, then What's most important for national unity is just an agreement about laws, economic self-determination, and a shared language. Therefore, we can move forward as a unified United States as long as black nationalism doesn't become a veil for racial hatred like white nationalism is. But we can still call forward his vision for African-American culture and for African-Americans to contribute to American culture completely and fully in a way that he hopes will be recognizable. So the accomplishments that he wants to see and that he does promote in his lifetime are race organizations. He founded the NAACP, or was one of the founders. Black colleges, Already by 1897, most of the HBCUs in this country had been formed. Black newspapers, there were many of these, even, even as early as 1828. So Du Bois knows all of this. There are, there are business organizations. There was a, a black, all-black insurance company in this historical moment. There is a school of literature and art, an intellectual clearinghouse for what he calls the products of the Negro mind, because he has founded the American Negro Academy already. So he's saying for us to be recognized as a race that can contribute, there has to be certain things in place, but these things are in place. Perhaps what they need is recognition. And perhaps, Du Bois suggests, if the contributions become undeniable and don't waver and people really contribute to these specific cultural productions and black nationalist productions of African-American identity, then the race problem will be easier to solve. And so here we see an articulation of cultural black nationalism, which must be inspired by the divine faith of black mothers, that out of the blood and dust of, of battle, because this is a very violent time in American history, particularly for African Americans, that a particular people will come forward and speak a divine truth which will make them free. And, and the importance here is that people will listen and African Americans will be heard. About 20, hmm, less than 20 years later, the Harlem Renaissance begins, and many white Americans do recognize the contributions of African American culture. He goes on to talk about keeping people together, keeping the 
the race or African-American culture unified, making sure that up here in paragraph 18, we don't laugh at ourselves, we don't ridicule ourselves, we don't accept negative representations of ourselves, that we make sure that young men are held accountable for their behavior and we um, keep the community tight in that context. And he sounds like um, Malcolm X here in claiming that social unity and being an upstanding citizen and responsible for your community socially in terms of ideal behavior will further the progress of the race. Malcolm X also talks a lot about a certain kind of respectability and dignity that he finds incredibly important. So this is be, this has been a very um, a very long video, and hopefully it will inspire you to read through this essay. I've read out loud as we went through the essay and tried to highlight some of the amazing lines and incredible thoughts and beautiful turns of phrase through which Du Bois describes his cultural black nationalism and questions the idea of race, which is the child of racism. Hopefully this video will help you read through the, uh, the article, this essay, and find your own moments of beauty and inspiration. Have a great day.